You know how they say that God lives in your heart? It's part of our modern idiom to say that God lives in your heart. We say that when you fall in love with someone, you should fall out of love with them. You break your heart. The prophet Jeremiah says that God will give you a new heart. The idea that God lives in our heart is something that the ancient people used to try and convey the feeling that God lives in the deepest part of you, the innermost part of you. Now we know that if you were to dissect someone and open up their heart, you don't find anything inside except blood, maybe some cholesterol plaque and whatever, maybe to be a bit more disgusting, some heartworms, but you know that you don't find God in your heart. In a proper healthy functioning heart, you just find blood. But the ancients say that God lives in your heart because when they open up a person and what they can see, what they can observe is that there are internal organs and there is the heart from which all the blood comes. Uh, it's, it's the pumping organ of your life force, your life blood, literally your life blood. And when they were trying to say that God lives in the deepest part of you, they would say God lives in your heart because that's what they could see. Other idioms that come from the ancient times is uh, in Malay they say dalam hati. They would say that uh, I feel it in my heart. Saya merasa ia di dalam hatiku, which uh, literally it's your liver. So when you translate and someone says that they love you uh, dalam hati. You don't translate it literally in English as saying that they love you in their liver. You say they love you in their heart because that's what they actually mean. That's what they're trying to say, that, that you are in the innermost part of them. They use the liver as the organ that represents their deepest parts. The ancient Greeks used the bowels. So when they say that a person had compassion on another person, the idiom they use is, he opened his bowels to him. So if they say, Mr. A had compassion on Mr. B, they would say, Mr. A opened his bowels to Mr. B. That's what they would literally say. Now in English, the opening of the bowels is an entirely different idiom. But they used anyway, the bowels as the innermost organ. And they said, that's where the compassion dwells. It's the deepest part of you. The deepest part of you. By the way, uh, we know now that the gut system, the bowels, the gastrointestinal tract has a wisdom of its own entirely, a wisdom that is comparable to the neurons that fire in your brain. But uh, that's beside the point for this video. What I'm talking about is how we use organs in the past, at least, to describe about how deep and innate something is you have a love for someone a love for god and you say that it's in your heart because that's the deepest organ that people could observe prior to the invention of the microscope when the microscope was invented then we realized that you could see deeper you could see um, to a, a a more fundamental level than organs you could see tissues and cells and then with the invention of the electron microscope you realize that you can see to an atomic level if the prophet jeremiah were speaking today in the 21st century he might say that god would put a new dna in you and that god would live in your dna because that's what he really means he, he means that the divine is intrinsically interwoven with your very being, the deepest part of you. In most people's imaginations today, you don't get much deeper than DNA and cells. So Jeremiah might have said that God lives in your cells. But as if you, you live on the internet a lot, as I do, you realize that we are much 
more than just our DNA, much more than our cells. We are made up of atoms, we are made up of electrons and protons. And it has been said that there is more space in us than mass. That is one atom that is made up of electrons buzzing around protons contains more space than mass. If you were to remove the space between all of our electrons, all of the human race could fit into a thimble that's about the size of a thumb. That thumb. All the human race could fit into that space. If you were to remove all the space around our electrons. Seven billion people. This is possible because it's been said that 99.99% of what makes us, us, this flesh and blood body that you can see, is actually space, not mass. You look in the mirror, you think that you've put on a bit of weight, but you're 99.99% empty space. It's hard to believe because, I mean, when you look at yourself, you see you're, you're right there. But on a quantum level, you are 99.99% space. And I went, when I went to research that, because I was giving a sermon on God living in our heart, I realized that, for example, the hydrogen atom consists of something like 99.9999996% space. I don't know exactly how many nines there are after the decimal point. I could Google it, you could Google it, but it's not entirely relevant because what I want to say is that that number ends with a six. And if you try to round out round up that number, there is no way you can arrive at 99.99%. If it's 99.9999996%, no matter at which point you round it up, it's going to be 100%. That means, practically speaking, on a subatomic level, we are 100% empty space. When people talk about reality being an illusion, that kind of gives you an inkling of how it could be, that reality could be an illusion. When in fact, everything you can see and touch, smell and hear, you look at yourself in the mirror, what you're looking at is 99.9999996% empty space or thereabouts. It's practically 100% empty space. So the Bible says that that which can be seen is created by that which cannot be seen. Everything that you can see is created by a strange interplay of energy and atoms that create what can be seen. And what can be seen is almost 0% of what actually exists. What actually exists, the virtual 100% that you and I are made out of, is empty space. Now we come back to God living in your heart. The ancients, without their microscopes, could observe to the level of organs. They look at the deepest organs in the case of, well, Jeremiah and his culture at the time, the heart. The Malays here in Malaysia, they looked at the liver. The Greeks looked inside. The deepest organ that they considered the deepest was the bowels. You and I today know that we exist. We can observe on a subatomic level. And when you observe at a subatomic level, we are practically empty. 
So if in Jeremiah's time they say that God lived in their heart, then it's like saying God lives in that, that organ in the center of you that pumps blood into the rest of you. If in our day we say that God lives in our DNA, but then we know that we are deeper than DNA. If we say that God lives in the interstitial spaces between our subatomic particles, that means God lives in that 99.999996% space, that virtually 100% space. That means God lives in you virtually completely. Paul the Apostle said that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Jesus himself said, when I ascend to heaven, my Father will send you the Holy Spirit, and you will be filled with the Spirit. So to what extent then does the Holy Spirit fill you? Your heart? I'm not sure how much blood your heart can hold, but I don't know. Half a liter of blood? In your heart? Maybe the Spirit fills all the blood in your body? I don't know how many liters? 20 liters? I'm not sure. But that's not where God actually dwells. That's how we were trying to explain that God dwells in the deepest part of us. The extent of our knowledge today is to the subatomic level. And we know that at the subatomic level, we don't really exist in that sense. We're almost entirely empty. If you are almost entirely empty, mathematically speaking, 100% empty, and God feels that emptiness, then God feels 100% of you, doesn't he? So who are you, really? Who am I? Who are we? And who is God? Is he Santa Claus, an old man in the sky? 